no traffic today, but perfect weather for another episode of Gardening Australia. I'll be back to show you around this stunning harbourside garden. But first, let's see what else is on this week's show. I've been waiting to give you this story for years. It's a beautiful Japanese garden that combines the quiet and the intimate with the bold and the majestic. And I just know you're going to love it. There's plenty to do around my place. I'm pruning a wormwood hedge, I'm dividing a globe artichoke, and I'm digging up and transplanting some willing volunteers. And I'll be introducing you to what I reckon is the world's sweetest strawberry. I met Sancha Dixon 12 months ago when she tracked me down to come along to her garden club and speak with all her other gardening buddies. And it was a real hoot. But I'm really excited to be back here again to show you her garden. Perched here on the edge of Sydney Harbour, a steep sloping block. But look at this view, it's spectacular. More importantly, there's all sorts of subtropical plant combinations here that you can really get into. Oh, look at this. We moved here 40 years ago, and when we arrived, it had the most beautiful view I've ever seen. But the house itself was very well built, but ugly as hell. And the garden was so terrible, so we pulled everything apart. Did you have any garden design ideas to get started with? I wanted the typical English garden. I wanted camellias, gardenias, azaleas, and lots of roses. And I spent more money on sprays and you know, anything that I could find to keep them alive and healthy. Try as she might, Sancha found she was always battling the conditions to grow a formal English garden. So she sought advice from local designers who convinced her to try plants that suited the coastal subtropical climate. It was absolutely wonderful just to realise that if you do go with what your land wants, it rewards you. You know, you get so much more. And whilst I love going into other people's English gardens, it's not for me anymore. The switch to plants that suit the subtropical climate has worked a treat. The garden is now thriving with a diverse collection of lush foliage and flowers. This is a great example of not being afraid of terraces and sloping sites, because, I mean, you have a lot of retaining wall, yep. but you only see barely a small percentage of it now. Well, that's right, and I intend, ultimately, to have it all covered. And I love mixing things. I don't like just having all one thing, which is why you see the pig's face with the convolvulus. And I do love convolvulus. It's old fashioned, but it's lovely. I like your little crassula border here. It can take that little bit of wind and the salt, but then wrapping around that like a scarf, you've got this star jasmine. Yep, and I don't know how it survives because I wouldn't have thought star jasmine would eat salt, but it obviously does and quite enjoys it. Seems to love it. It does. What a great feature plant you've got here, the Bismarck palm. I'm glad you love it. I love it too. The garden has to have a lot of different shapes and a different lot of colours, and this is just a colour all its own. Yeah, how would you describe it? It's Bismarck blue. Bismarck blue. Yep. There you go. You, yep. can, you can become a, yeah, an, an art a paint palette. Yes, no, a nail polish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can feel the change here, like we've moved from that really exposed area into quite a, a, a little haven, a, a real microclimate. It is. The lily pilly had to have its top cut out, but it let so much light in that it opened up this opportunity to have all these hanging baskets. I love the ripsalis, the fact it, it, it gives a cool feeling. It's like a waterfall. But the orchids also seem to like being strapped to the trees. And, of course, the old man's beard. Um, <laughs> just for me. Yeah, just for you. But I don't know that it really likes as much salt as it gets here. But it's OK. I would like to think this is the way nature would do it if it had the chance. That's why I don't have lines anywhere. I just want it to look as if 
you know, the birds dropped the seeds and it started of its own accord. What have been some of the most useful plants you've used over the time? I think probably the gingers. They fill a good space. The only problem with them is you have to cut the roots out every now and again with them. But I love my bromeliads, as you know, and they also breed madly. So you've got lots to give away or to reuse, putting on trees or whatever you want. They're just fabulous. And I love my Jeffrey, which is the cycad over here. So what's, um, what's the story behind Jeffrey? Well, Jeffrey was given to me by a very dear friend whose husband died, and he gave it to her, and he was an old friend of mine. So he's Jeffrey, and he's done so well since he moved here from Wallara. <laughs> I like the way that you personalise the plants. I mean, they really are part of your family. Oh, they are. They're my friends. And, um, and the ones that don't like me tell me immediately, like, and... Um, you know, the others, you know, just blossom. I mean, Jeffrey liked me, and look at him, he's doing well. Now, Sancha, one, <laughs> one of the things that I've loved from the first time I came to your garden was the fact that you personalise so many things, and, well, I can't come without leaving something in the hope that I might become one of those little signs. And I've searched high and low for veggies, and I realise you don't have veggies, I so I thought, what better thing to offer than some Warrigal greens? Oh, how wonderful. It's a native bush spinach. But the beauty of it is, it does a lot of the things that you're after, which is cascade and oh, spread over it? the ground with no effort. Now, what you do have to do is slightly blanch it before you eat it so that oh, you that's don't... Quite nice. Um, yeah, but too much of that oxalic acid can actually be oh, quite toxic. Oh, can it? Right. But you can use it as normal spinach. You can handle full sun. Fantastic. Oh, that's so Definitely, I've got a sign with your name on it. I didn't go overboard with the wrapping. But, uh, you know. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. Bless your oh, heart. Mwah. Thank you so much. I'll go and put him in some water. What trees won't drop leaves over my garden? That's a question that many gardeners ask. Interestingly, all trees drop their leaves over the year. Deciduous trees drop their leaves in one heap in autumn, whereas evergreen trees, like natives, often shed their leaves over the whole 12 months of the year. So instead of sweeping up the leaves just at one time of year, you'll be sweeping them up all year round. How often should you fertilise your lawn? Well, feed it when it needs it. But as a rule of thumb, I fertilise twice a year. One in early spring, as the ground warms up and growth is increased, and again in early autumn, to help your lawn recover from the summer and grow into the cold. A lazy mate of mine asked me, do you really need to deadhead ornamental plants? In other words, chop off the spent flowers. Well, the impact of not deadheading will differ depending on the species, but as a general rule, if you want your plants to be tidier, bushier, and flower more strongly, then yes, deadhead. This is a globe artichoke, and while I love to eat the unopened flower buds, I don't always get around to harvesting them. So if I don't, I simply let them flower and enjoy the beautiful purple thistle-like flowers. Even as the flowers dry, I have a bit of fun with a can of red spray paint. And when the flowers finally fall apart, I cut the stalks right down to ground level and the plant will reshoot. This clump's only been in the ground for a couple of years, so it doesn't need any attention. But that's not the case over here. I cut these old flower spikes back about a month ago and you can see that this old artichoke has started to reshoot already. This clump's been in the ground for about five years and it's starting to lose its puff. So my first autumn job for today is to dig it up divide it and replant. You never know what tools you're going to need to split apart an old clump. Sometimes you use a sharp spade or knife, but this time I think I'll be able to pull it apart by hand. Now this is a division and this is ready to go. But this little thing, I reckon, is actually a seedling that's seeded in at the base of the old plant. 
and both of them, even though they look a bit sad, will grow really well. To neaten the divisions up, I'm removing the old stalks with a serrated knife. Artichokes like a sunny position in well-drained soil. If you've got sandy soil, you might want to add a bit of organic matter. But this soil's already been improved with cow manure for a previous crop, so it's ready to go after a light forking. Space your artichokes about a metre apart. You don't have to be fussy about planting, just bung them in. Artichokes done, time to get out the hedge trimmer. I use wormwood hedges extensively throughout my garden as a windbreak. And in autumn, I like to cut them back by about a third to keep the plants nice and dense. Pruning wormwood in autumn means the plants have a chance to recover before growth slows in winter. I've recently pruned the hedge around the veggie patch and it's coming back and looking good already. The veggie patch I've pruned square, but this one is going to have more of a waveform to it. Some people put the prunings into their wardrobes to discourage moths, but I use them in the chook nesting boxes to help deter mites. My next job starts with this hardy Mediterranean herb called rue, sometimes known as herb of grace. Now, I love it in my garden because it thrives, and I also love the contrast between its bright yellow flowers and its blue-grey foliage. But as an added bonus, the bees and beneficial insects love it too. Now, one of the things I'm excited about is I've just noticed that I've got some volunteer plants, some self-seeders that have appeared right nearby, and I'm going to dig them up and share them. I'm digging up a good clod of earth to minimise root damage and simply potting them up. I'm watering them in with a seaweed-based plant tonic to reduce transplant shock. One of the interesting things about rue is it has a really pungent, fetid smell, and I reckon that's why they use it to deter cats. So I might even give these to friends who have a cat problem. So there you go. In just a couple of hours, I feel like I've really achieved something. Why don't you get that feeling too?
花鳥風月美しい自然を体験し自分を学ぶこと There's something very special about a Japanese garden and this amazing place feels as though it could be in Kyoto but it's actually part of the University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba It's the largest Japanese garden in Australia. It's actually over four hectares. It's the largest stroll garden in the Southern Hemisphere. And the whole lake area is about a quarter acre of water. Russell Campbell is a horticulturist, garden designer, and one of the creative minds behind this landmark place. This is in the Edo period when they started creating the noblemen in Japan. They started gathering great wealth. And rather than just having little viewing gardens where they sat on a veranda and looked into the garden, they decided to make a garden larger where they could walk into it, experience the elements in the garden. When it comes to design, there's so much more than meets the eye in a Japanese garden. Now, Jerry, please watch your step as you're walking up here. As you can see, these stepping stones have been laid very unevenly. They're a tripping hazard. The idea is you need to look where you're walking at all times, but if you look up, you can't see out because of the anonymous hedge here, which is above your eye height. Then you reach the summer pavilion here, and the garden opens up in front of you. Oh, wow. Oh, let's get in there. Okay, let's go and have a look. We're just going to leave the summer pavilion now. Here being the real world, Mystic Lines. Now, we're on one of the three more islands in the centre of the Celestial Sea. We've left the real world. Now we're going on to one of the bridges that join the real world with the mystical islands. And from the bridge, you can see out into the Celestial Ocean, we've got the third rock island, which there's no access to, and that is the centre of the Buddhist universe. The whole world revolves around that point in the Buddhist mind. We even have features like male rock and a female rock. And you see the king of bonsai, the black pine, there, shaped meticulously. This whole landscape is imbued with symbolism, isn't it? Oh, there's a lot of symbolism. It comes from the 16th century, a lot of religious aspects. It all embodies to make a beautiful garden. We're now entering the mountain stream area. It's on the side of the wild hillside, a wild mountainous area. This whole mountain here was man-made. It was basically to create a whole balance, a windbreak for the garden, and also it creates an ecosystem within the garden. Here you can see the large trees, the bamboo in the background, massive boulders, beautiful flowing, calming effect of the water. It just has a whole unreal feeling. Kids love this area. They get away from mum and dad, come up here, just have a great time. It seems deceptively wild, but everything has been thought through, hasn't it? Oh, definitely. The designer did a brilliant job. Very little is left to chance in this garden. Everything has a reason and a place. Here we come to the Karasen Sui. This is what they call the contemplation garden or the dry garden. This is an area that strongly suggests the power of water, but there's no water present. If you have a look at the gravel, it's all been raked, it represents waves. Yes. You have rocks representing islands, and then you have an area like this with flat rock, which represents where the water would flow from the hillside, the waterfall. And even the plants here, they're all being pruned to represent rocks. You've got Japanese cycads, then you've got xylosmas, buxus, again, all being shaped represent the craggy shoreline. In Japan, the practicing monk will come out every day and rake this garden, and they spend about an hour or so raking it, and they clears their mind of all their preconceived earthly ideas and gives them pure thoughts or thoughts of nothingness, which then puts them closer to their god Buddha. I love listening to the sound of the decomposed green as you walk on it. It's a lovely scrunch. It has a soothing of calming effect. The same as the strong water and the soft water, it all creates different emotions. Then you come to areas like the bamboo grove. You hear a different sound here with a clunk, clunk. It's an unnatural sound of Australia. Feel the bamboo, the texture of it. It's beautiful. This garden has certainly been created on a grand scale, but there are also ways to capture some of its wow factor and apply it to an average backyard. I'd suggest having something very simple, maybe a rock arrangement, maybe a small water feature. For a home garden, if it was a courtyard garden, they could just have some gravel, maybe a rock placement, and even one plant would be enough to fulfil the idea of a Japanese garden. 
What would be your favourite plants? Oh, for me, in a small scale yard, backyard type thing, gracilis bamboo, non-invasive, beautiful, creates a theme. Oh, I love maples, Japanese maples, you can't go past that. And possibly camellias. Yeah, that'd be my top three. So whether you add some simple design elements to your own backyard or enjoy the large-scale impact of this impressive place, it's easy to be inspired by the exquisite beauty of a Japanese garden. Everyone knows the benefit of mulches in your garden. There are organic mulches, things like pea straw, sugarcane mulch and mushroom compost. There's also inorganic mulches that are inert. They don't break down. And here are two different kinds. This is scoria mulch. There's the red type. And this is a really good looking black scoria. Have a look at that. Now, the beauty of scoria as a mulch is that it tends to be weed free. Very rarely do you see weeds sort of springing up. And if they do, awfully easy to pull them out. The other thing is that when it rains, the water will go right through because these large bits of scoria will really allow the water to get right down where it's needed, the plant roots. The other beauty is that if you put it about 10 centimetres thick, four inches, that's quite deep, you'll find that instead of the soil caking and baking over summer, it remains nice and cool for the plant roots. People associate scoria with cacti and succulent gardens, but there are plenty of other uses. Have a look at it, especially if it's readily available in your area. As a father of two, I'm always on the lookout for plants that will spark my girls' interests and get them into eating fresh fruit. And nothing is as tempting as one of the world's sweetest fruit, the alpine strawberry. They're unnaturally sweet. They're as intense as little balls of sherbet. Interestingly, your alpine strawberry isn't your average strawberry that you get from the nursery. They're a different species. The plants you get are usually runner forming, whereas these are clump forming. They'll get to about 40 centimetres. And the tiny fruit they produce are ideal for those little fingers to pick them off. And if a fruit drops here and there, you don't have to worry. They produce viable seed. So next season, you'll have new plants. Like the more common strawberry varieties, the alpine strawberries need a deep, rich, acidic soil. This bed is jam-packed full of manures and compost. While they have a spread of 40 centimetres, I'm spacing them about 30 centimetres apart for dense foliage coverage. This way, the birds are less likely to spot them and eat them. Water in well and mulch with straw or pine needles. This will help to maintain the acidity of the soil. Alpine strawberries are one of the easiest and loveliest fruits to have in the garden, and the plants work well in the ornamental border as well. They may produce a small fruit, but I guarantee you, it's a big flavour. With today being April 1st, there's no better time to have a look at the world's most famous garden-related April Fool's hoax. The year was 1957, and everyone believed everything the BBC said. It isn't only in Britain that spring this year has taken everyone by surprise. Here, in the Ticino, on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, the slopes overlooking Lake Lugano have already burst into flower, at least a fortnight earlier than usual. But what, you may ask, has the early and welcome arrival of bees and blossom to do with food? Well, it's simply that the past winter, one of the mildest in living memory, has had its effect in other ways as well. Most important of all, it's resulted in an exceptionally heavy spaghetti crop. The last two weeks of March are an anxious time for the spaghetti farmer. There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not entirely ruining the crop, generally impairs the flavour and makes it difficult for him to obtain top prices in world markets. But now these dangers are over and the spaghetti harvest goes forward. 
spaghetti cultivation here in Switzerland is not, of course, carried out on anything like the tremendous scale of the Italian industry. Many of you, I'm sure, will have seen pictures of the vast spaghetti plantations in the Po Valley. For the Swiss, however, it tends to be more of a family affair. Another reason why this may be a bumper year lies in the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, the tiny creature whose depredations have caused much concern in the past. After picking, the spaghetti is laid out to dry in the warm alpine sun. Many people are often puzzled by the fact that spaghetti is produced at such uniform length. But this is the result of many years of patient endeavor by plant breeders who've succeeded in producing the perfect spaghetti. And now the harvest is marked by a traditional meal. Toasts to the new crop are drunk in these pocalinos. And then the waiters enter bearing the ceremonial dish. And it is, of course, spaghetti. Picked earlier in the day, dried in the sun, and so brought fresh from garden to table at the very peak of condition. For those who love this dish, there's nothing like real homegrown spaghetti. After the story aired, the BBC was bombarded with callers wanting to know how to grow spaghetti in their backyard. They were told to take a sprig and put it in a tin of tomato sauce and then hope for the best. Classic. Anyway, here's what's coming up on next week's show. Look at this place. It's massive. I meet a couple with the drive and nous to create a grand scale rambling country garden and find out how they've done it. Have a look at this beautiful archway that's been formed out of these two apple trees that have been trained in the old technique of espaliering. And I've got a few tips that will hopefully mean you'll get the most out of your own espalier at home. And I'm looking forward to catching up with our new guest presenter, Indira Naidu. I'm, I'm really excited about sharing stories about people not only converting balconies like mine, but rooftops, uh, terraces, verges, vertical walls, whatever space they have. They can...